Welcome. My name is Dr. Jamie Januchis, author of The Rule of Manhood and your host of Intellectual History Talk. The hard-hitting news show where we describe, examine, question, and analyze significant ideas with history's most relevant guests. Today's topic is the controversial Communist Manifesto, with special guests, the two authors, political philosophers, and pioneering economists, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Joining us also in studio is leading 20th century social historian of the British working class and political activist, Professor E.P. Thompson. Calling in from London is cultural historian of modern Britain and author of Serving a Wired World, Dr. Katie Hindmarch Watson. And connecting from a yacht somewhere in the South Pacific are three titans of tech industries. Let me first introduce the entrepreneur and business magnet, Elon Musk, American entrepreneur and media mogul, Jeff Bezos. And finally, we have Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook. Welcome, one and all. Let's talk some history. When the ideas of Karl Marx are discussed today, most people correctly focus on Marx's thoughts on political society and property, which he outlined at the end of his 19th century masterpiece, The Communist Manifesto. This famous document, written by Marx and his associate Friedrich Engels, describes and then motivates its readers to enact a revolution to create a perfect society without class distinctions. Is that right, Professor Marx? Please, call me Karl. Yes, I desire all to live in a just society where all production of material goods and profit have been concentrated in the hands of a vast association of the whole nation, and all members of society share in a radical equality. In other words, no one owns anything. Unlike, unlike, that's now terrible. No, no. The people will own everything. The final vision of the communist society is one without public power of a political character, and thereby without the oppression of organized power. Uh, what a utopian pipe dream, Karl. Do you really imagine all the people sharing the world and living a life in peace? Impossible. Just the other day I was- I can't imagine a world without possessions. Only greed and hunger will successfully motivate the best of us to unite as one in a brotherhood of global markets. Yeah, you tell them, Jeff. Do I even need to explain why the revolution of the working class proletarians is necessary? These greedy bourgeois capitalists do not understand the path of progress to history. What? I know the future, and it's on Mars. No, it's in renewable energy and advanced technology. I dream of a world where emotional machines will appropriately mirror our feelings. And your dreams are lame, Mark. Yeah, man, get a rocket. Do you even own a rocket? And you call yourself a billionaire? Now, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope that one day the world will live as one, under one market governed by desire and dominated by my international corporation that delivers to you everything you can afford to buy. Yeah, and I imagine a world living in peace, where all of our personal lives are fully shared with corporations without government intervention, and our opinions can be purchased and manipulated. Move aside, pal. I want that information. That information's mine. Oh, no, it's mine. It's mine. E excuse me. Excuse me, gentlemen. Let's return to our topic for the day. Dr. Heinmarch Watson, isn't it true that the manifesto argued that Marx's type of utopian society would be achieved through a revolution of the working class, the proletariat, overthrowing the ruling class, the bourgeoisie? Yes, that's exactly right, Jamie. Marx thought that the revolution would be fueled both by the outrage proletarians feel when they recognize how the world's wealthy individuals, who are commonly known today as the 1%, disproportionately control all economic and political power. Hey, she's talking about us. And when the numbers of proletarians inevitably swell with marginalized members of the bourgeoisie. Marx imagined big historical change coming out of the weaknesses and contradictions inherent in the economic systems people were currently experiencing. Modern capitalism for Marx was fundamentally unstable and destructive. He therefore believed the system would ultimately implode. Marx's movement would initially enact political and social measures to revolutionize the social order. Measures including free education for all children in public schools, 
the abolition of private property, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, the abolition of inheritance rights, centralization of credit in the hands of the state, and equal liability of all to work. Uh, get out of here. We can't have any of that. No, 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 definitely no, not gonna like that. Over the course of time, Marx believed these messers would make class distinctions disappear and create a free association between people. So is it the Marxist ideal to create a society in which no one is disadvantaged by the class in which they were born? Even more. The dream is that no one would be born into a class structure, but instead a classless and completely free society where all enjoy the fruits of their labor. Come on, there's no way. It's socialism. Unlike, unlike, that's no terrible. This is just what Marx thought. And Engels. Yet, of course, no communist nation has ever achieved this end goal of creating a perfectly equal and classless society. That's right. These radical and anti-free market measures put forward to different degrees in places like the Soviet Union and communist China have resulted in significantly unfree and unequal algorithms, uh, uh, I mean, societies. You got it, bro. The real world is far from the utopia imagined by Marx. Correct. These aforementioned societies failed even by Marxist standards because they did not reach their ultimate goal of a classless society. And when combined with extremely powerful and oppressive governments, these societies appear nowhere close to achieving the communist dream. Despite these failed communist experiments, Marx's ideas and Engels, Marx's ideas concerning class, property, and society have proven extremely valuable to think with for modern historians, philosophers, and social scientists, especially as we seek to understand how the material world and the material relations of labor, production, and property have been foundational in shaping humans and their communities over time. Some historians even view the material world as the central driver of our shared historical past. So today, we're going to focus on two central concepts from Marx's thought that have shaped the philosophy of history, class and historical materialism. Let's first consider the concept of class. This word gets used a lot in contemporary society to describe general groupings of people according to perceived or actual economic or social status. For example, most people in America like to consider themselves middle class, or we may label blue collar workers as working class or call elites the upper class. Um, uh, excuse the interruption, but as historians, we have to be careful when discussing Marx's use of the term class, because for Marx, the term carries several very important qualifiers for its usage. Um, allow me to summarize. The notion of class entails the notion of historical relationship. And class happens when some men, as a result of common experiences uh, inherited or shared, feel and articulate the identity of their interests as between themselves and as against other men whose interests are different from and usually opposed to theirs. The class experience is largely determined by the productive relations into which men are born or enter involuntarily. Class consciousness is the way in which these experiences are handled in cultural terms, embodied in traditions, value systems, ideas, and institutional forms. Consciousness of class arises in the same way in different times and places, but never in just the same way. So Edward, if I am understanding you correctly, there are three necessary conditions that must be met in order for a group of people to qualify as a class. First, you need a group of people who have common experiences and interests based upon their productive relations. That is, the people in this group have to have experiences or interests in common that are based on their work and what they own or do not own. So factory owners and financiers might form classes in this sense because they commonly own materials, capital, or other assets. Laborers could also become a class because although they lack such ownership, their labor increases the capital that others do own. Exactly. We hardworking, brilliant entrepreneurs form the most enviable class. Just ask Time Magazine. No, no, no. Again, that's only the first part of the definition of class, although it is usually the only aspect mentioned in contemporary discussions. As given, 
it's far too simplistic to represent Marx's full account, because class, in the Marxist sense, is a relationship and not a thing. We need two more conditions to aptly describe the Marxist idea of this historical relationship. Yes, this is why, second, we must note that those who share productive relations must be against others whose interests are different from and usually opposed to their material interests. Yes, conflict is a necessary aspect to my understanding of class. Individuals who share one economic interest or set of experiences must necessarily be set against others who share a different interest or experience. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of these class struggles. The antagonisms between classes and the conditions of oppression and of struggles have been constant, uninterrupted, and universal. If we take into account that the material world has only finite amounts of property and productive materials and finite amounts of skilled or unskilled labor, and that there are indeed limits to who can own things and who can work, my view perfectly explains history. In short, the fact that one group controls something valuable means that other groups cannot own it. For example, one group's ownership of labor means that others cannot find jobs. Conflict is the natural result of such class struggles. Now, if these historical relationships necessarily lead to class antagonisms, to the opposition of oppressor and oppressed, what else could be needed to qualify something as a class? The third component is class consciousness. And this component is often of significant interest to social historians and historians of culture studying the past. Class consciousness includes both the conscious recognition of those within a class that they are indeed in a class, and also the outward and public expression of this consciousness in cultural terms. This could be expressed in numerous ways songs, parades, clothing, possessions, and other popular culture expressions. Thank you, Edward. To summarize, a class, according to Marx, is more than a collection of people. The group of people must recognize themselves as first sharing common experiences and interests through their productive relations. Second, standing against others with different and often oppositional experiences and interests. And third, recognizing this consciousness while expressing it together culturally. Exactly! A very famous example of a class that fulfills all three requirements is the sans-culottes in the French Revolution. Through the revolution, this group of people became conscious of their shared experiences and interests as urban laborers, saw themselves as standing against the French aristocracy and monarchy, and express their consciousness culturally through naming themselves after their working class attire. Their sans-culottes trousers distinguished them from the fashionable silk knee breeches worn by the upper class. They organized themselves to fight for direct democracy, tax reform, abolishing the monarchy, and other socially progressive ideas that serve their shared interests. They are a class in the Marxist framework. And because Marx held that the basis of all culture is economic, and economics as accounting for all culture, from politics and law to religion, philosophy and social structure, these class conflicts would be inextricably linked with the politics, beliefs and culture of any given society. We humans are significantly shaped and our ideas, our beliefs and our choices by our material relations. Carl, what do you want to add? Let me summarize it for you in plain speech, as I always do. The totality of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which corresponds definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of man that determines their existence, but their social existence that determines their consciousness. Whoa, that's a mouthful. Typical philosophical mumbo jumbo. What does it even mean? It means that all aspects of our lives are governed and regulated by our material relationships. 
It means that all history is a history of class struggles. It means that one day you and your capitalist cronies are going down. Burn. Get out of here with that. There's no way. No, no, that's never gonna happen. I have way too many likes for that. Stop living in the past. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please calm down. I think we're now very well prepared to discuss the second central concept connected to Marx and Engels' view of history, historical materialism. In short, Marx argues in the Communist Manifesto that class conflicts over material conditions have formed the basis of all human societies and driven history. To understand the past and present, Marx believes we should study the material world in these conditions of oppression, not lofty ideas about mind or spirit or the metaphysics of the human person. Exactly! Life is competition, with classes ready to fight until the bitter end for a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or the common ruin of the other contending classes. Class conflict has shaped the world! The proletariat must be the victor. To bring your ideas more to life, Carl, if I may, I want to compare your concept of historical materialism with the biggest college basketball tournament played every March in the United States. Let me tell you about the little something I call Marx's madness. You see, early in the Communist Manifesto, after declaring that all history is the history of class struggles, Marx and Engels provide a quick description of these class struggles over time. They note the formative power of conflict between oppressor and oppressed, freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, as always standing in constant opposition to one another. Sometimes these conflicts have been held out in the open, but occasionally there are hidden battles. Ah, yes, the earlier epochs of struggle are really exciting to watch. They are so complicated, various, messy. There are so many gradations of social rankings. Absolutely. There were many expected lopsided victories between contenders of varying rank. I mean, of course. But also a surprising number of revolutionary underdogs upsetting established victors with both expected and unexpected outcomes. And just like in the college basketball tournament, only the winners advanced to fight another foe in history's greatest real life tournament. Those who fizzled over time were taken down by stronger class groups. We should remember though that class antagonism does not cease over time, but arises from the ruins of its prior contests and reformulates into new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle to replace the old ones. For example, Although the guild masters may have been victorious over the journeymen in one epoch, in the next era, they must battle new and unexpected struggles against foreign laborers, financiers, and developing factory owners. And even more surprising, in Mark's Madness, brand new teams may join in the middle of the tournament, having formed from refigured classes or new groups that become conscious through the struggle. Yes, yes, yes. And these teams in the tournament uh, they do not mark the end of our social evolution, but part of the ongoing struggle. Marx and Engels understood that history is going somewhere towards a final showdown between the last two teams, <laughs> oppressor and oppressed. In the 19th century, Marx believed history had been playing out these conflicts in society through multiple rounds, through the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, even the Final Four, to reach the final round of the two great hostile camps, the two great classes directly facing each other in the modern age, bourgeoisie and proletariat. The great political and economic upheavals of our epoch, discovery, colonization and globalization, industrialization, machinery, and the manufacturing system, the rise of the third estate in political revolutions, and the centralization of our governments has brought society to this final struggle. Our manifesto was written to be the playbook for the proletariat to become fully conscious of itself and to win this global final round and become world champions. After which, they would abolish the greed of the stockpiling bourgeoisie and finally end the tournament of class struggle. But that's not how it worked out in the 20th and 21st centuries. Capitalism has won. Money talks and always wins. Nonsense, we still fight. 
let the ruling classes tremble at our revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite! We will find your bourgeoisie, and we will find your little yacht. Ha! Huh. Yeah, I'll burn your friends list. Let's teach those capitalists who has the power. Onto the yacht! Unleash the trolls! <laughs> Get to the boats! Attack the yacht! Release the drone! We need more floaties! I know where you live! Oh no, they found us. Look out. Time to go to phase four. Curses! Foiled again! I'm out of here. Lift off. The proletarian revolution has not gone the way Marx and Engels planned. Uh, this final matchup still hasn't ended, but their ideas will continue to shape our central debates and the ways historians understand the past. Until next time. <laughs>